Let's study 10th standard ICIC chapter 8, the circulatory system. There are three types of fluids in our body. The main types are blood, tissue fluid and lymph. Apart from that, we have some uh, other fluids as well. For example, the synovial fluid, etc. Blood is contained in the heart and the blood vessels and it is continuously flowing through the arteries, veins and capillaries. Tissue fluid occupies all the spaces between the cells in the organs. So all the cells are bathing in the tissue fluid. Lymph is contained within lymph vessels and lymphatic organs such as spleen and tonsils. In fact, the lymph is derived from blood. You see, often a blood constituents squeeze out of the capillaries, especially the blood plasma and the WBCs. And then they are called tissue fluid. So tissue fluid mostly contains the blood plasma and WBCs. And then this excess of tissue fluid is channeled into lymph vessels and now it is called lymph. So again, lymph has the blood plasma with the dissolved substances and the WBCs. It does not have RBCs and platelets. Also, the blood is pumped by an organ called the heart. So it goes from heart to body, body to heart, and then heart to lungs, lungs to heart. So that's a double circulation here. Whereas lymph is not pumped by anything. Lymph only travels from body towards the heart. In fact, it joins the blood yet again. It originated from blood and it joins the blood. And it moves because of the muscular movements of our body. That is why exercising is a very good way to increase the lymph transportation in our body, which is important because lymph has WBCs. So our immunity becomes better that way. Now notice how the left ventricle, yeah, this is the left here, heart. In biology, this side is the left because in the human body, if you notice, this will be the left part of your body. Here the diagram is inverted. It's a mirror image of your heart actually. So the left ventricle pumps oxygenated blood to the body. Now this oxygenated blood is used up by the various tissues and organs of a body. Um, the blood is delivered by the capillaries and the blood becomes deoxygenated, which is shown as blue, but remember blood is never blue unless you are from Mars. Now this deoxygenated blood is again collected in the veins. Yeah, yeah the capillaries again reunite to form veins and the veins deliver this deoxygenated blood to the heart, to the right atrium. From the right atrium, the blood goes to the right ventricle. This diagram is misleading. It's not proper. Better diagrams are there ahead in the book. And remember the video I just showed at the start of this session. So the right ventricle will now pump the deoxygenated blood to the lungs where it will get oxygenated. And how it, that happens with the alveoli you've studied in ninth standard respiratory system. And this oxygenated blood comes back to the left atrium or auricle, it's the same thing. And then it goes to the right left ventricle and the cycle continues. So that's the cardiac cycle. From heart to body, body to heart is called systemic circulation and heart to lungs, lungs to heart is called pulmonary circulation. And that is why it is a double circulation. Also note how blood is always contained in the blood vessels or in this closed organ. It's not freely flowing like the lymph or the tissue fluid. That's why the R circulation of blood is called the closed blood circulation system, which is useful because it generates enough pressure for processes like ultrafiltration, which happens in the kidney to produce urine. Insects have open blood circulatory system, which means that they don't have blood vessels through which the blood flows. The blood just flows in some open spaces in their body. So it's called open blood circulatory system. So they can't do ultrafiltration, but that's okay because they don't have a kidney. Properties of blood, they are never stationary. Color, bright red or dark red. Volume around five to six liters of blood in an adult human, five to six liters. Some students may have a more volume of blood after having sucked a lot of blood from a tutor's brain. Taste is saltish. I'm sure all of you have tasted it at some point of time. It's slightly alkaline. pH is 7.3 to 7.45. That's very slightly alkaline, but it's important to maintain this pH level of the blood. Otherwise it can be dangerous. Functions of blood. Apart from the fact that it is a source of nutrition for vampires, in normal humans, the following are the functions. Transport of digested food. All the nutrients like glucose, amino acids, vitamins absorbed by the blood at the small intestine has to be transported to the various parts of the body. They help in transportation of oxygen. You see RBCs have hemoglobin and hemoglobin can combine with oxygen to form oxyhemoglobin. 
and which is unstable. So once they reach tissues which have deficiency of oxygen, then the oxygen will be delivered and carbon dioxide will be accepted. And that carbon dioxide combines with the hemoglobin to form carb amino hemoglobin. And this deoxygenated blood will now be transported to the lungs from where the CO2 is exhaled out of the body. Of course, carbon dioxide can be transported even without hemoglobin. CO2 is dissolved in the blood plasma in the form of various salts like bicarbonates. It helps in transport of excretory material. You see, the liver produces a lot of urea during deamination. This urea has to be transported to the kidneys to be filtered out to form urine. Even hormones uh, produced by endocrine glands are distributed by the blood. And even heat has to be distributed by blood so that the body temperature is uniform throughout the body. So you can see that blood transports so many things. Blood also produce, uh, provides us with protection. For example, when you get a cut, a clot can be formed not only on the skin surface but even inside your body. If some blood vessel has ruptured, a clot is formed which will prevent further loss of blood and, and prevent the entry of disease-causing germs. But in case germs do enter our body, then we have our immunity, that is the WBCs in the blood, which can engulf bacteria. What is that called? That's right, phagocytosis. Some WBCs also produce antitoxins and antibodies to protect our body. Composition of blood, the liquid part, the fluid part, plasma is around 60% and the cells are RBCs, WBCs and platelets. Plasma has many things dissolved in it. These are the things and it's light yellow in color. If you remove all the cells, then it'll look light yellow. There are many other substances apart from water and proteins like salts, sodium chloride, bicarbonates and the nutrients in it, glucose, amino acids and fibrinogen, which is very important for blood clotting, hormones, of course, and urea and excretory product. So from the blood, if you remove all the cellular elements, it is called blood plasma. From the plasma, if you remove fibrinogen, now it is called serum. So what does serum have now? Well, it has water, glucose, etc. But most importantly, serum may have antitoxins and antibodies, which is very important for passive immunity. Now let's talk about the cellular parts. RBC is also called erythrocytes. They are oxygen carriers because they have hemoglobin. They are biconcave in shape. That's like a donut, but without a hole. This increases their total surface area. And anyway, they don't have a nucleus, so they can afford to have such a shape. They don't even have endoplasmic reticulum, so that they are flexible enough to be transported in the tiniest capillaries of the body. We have so many capillaries in our body. If only we could remove all the capillaries of the body and lay them end to end, then we will die. So RBCs were born with a nucleus from the bone marrow but uh, they lose it, they become enucleated and that's why their lifespan is just 120 days. Their job is just to deliver stuff and perish. They don't even have uh, mitochondria because if they would, then they would use up a lot of the oxygen, then what will they deliver? WBCs are of many types. Let's learn the f top five types. Neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, lymphocytes and monocytes. More about it soon, but they give us immunity. Platelets are extremely small. By the way, they are called copper cells because these are actually corpses. They're going to die very soon. RBCs are the smallest cells, like proper cells in the human body. A human male has around 5 million RBCs per cubic millimeter of blood. But an adult female has slightly less RBCs per cubic millimeter of blood. Hemoglobin. That's a chemical constituent of RBCs. It has a colorless spongy body called the stroma. Yes, the same, same name was used even to study the chloroplasts. The hemoglobin has two parts. The iron containing part called hemin and the protein called globin. With oxygen, it can combine to form oxyhemoglobin and with carbon dioxide it forms carb amino hemoglobin. But if it combines with carbon monoxide, then it forms carboxyhemoglobin, which is a very stable compound. It's a, a very dangerous incident. It is called carbon monoxide poisoning. If all the hemoglobin is uh, stuck with carbon monoxide, then who will transport oxygen in the body? It is not correct to say that veins carry carbon dioxide and no oxygen. That's not true. You see, inside the lungs, the hemoglobin becomes 98% saturated with oxygen. And that is called oxygenated blood. And most of this oxygen is uh, used by the tissues. 
but the deoxygenated blood still contains 75% oxygen. So even the deoxygenated blood is not actually free of oxygen. That is why even if you hold your breath, you can survive for a few minutes because the blood has oxygen still. The life and death of RBCs. RBCs are produced in the red bone marrow of long bones. In an embryo, however, it is produced in the liver and spleen. And in children, it is uh, produced in the bone marrow of all the bones. Unlike in adults, where it is produced only in the long bones like ribs, breastbone and ileum. They don't have a nuclei, as I explained. And after 120 days, they are destroyed in the spleen, liver and bone marrow. Spleen, by the way, is called the graveyard of these RBCs. And the hemoglobin's iron part is reused by the liver. Reused in making the bile pigment called bilirubin, which is important for digestion. RBCs are deficient, but more efficient. They are deficient because they don't have nucleus, mitochondria and endoplasmic reticulum, as I explained. But that is only to make it very efficient transporters. RBC count is lowered by 5% during sleep and it increases during physical activity or when you are at a height above 4200 meters because in such situations more rounds have to be made to deliver oxygen to all parts of the body. If there are too many RBCs in the blood it's called polycythemia disorder and if there is very less RBCs it is called erythropenia. Learn the spellings well. WBCs are called leukocytes. They have they are just 4,000 to 8,000 per millimeter cube of blood, so far less than RBCs, but no doubt they are extremely vital for our survival. Often they squeeze out of the capillaries by a process called diapedesis. In fact, 90% of their life is spent outside the blood capillaries and in the tissue fluid or in the lymph. So one wonders why should we call them white right blood cell when they just spend 10% of their life in blood. Even they are produced in red bone marrow and even in lymph nodes like your tonsils and spleen. They are also produced in the liver and the spleen. Their average life is about two weeks. They are very brave soldiers with a short lifespan. And they are destroyed in the same manner as RBCs. Leukemia is a cancer of the tissue forming WBCs whose number increases many fold at the cost of RBCs. So leukemia, a lot of WBCs are produced unnecessarily because of which the number of RBCs production is decreased. The only treatment is blood transfusion, but there's no cure for it. Leukopenia is the abnormal decrease in the number of WBCs. Functions of leukocytes. First, phagocytosis. It is a process in which most of the WBCs, they end like neutrophils, and particularly neutrophils, engulf the particle-like solid substances, especially bacteria, and they destroy it. So if the number of WBCs becomes more than 50,000 or more per cubic millimeter, that means there is some serious infection in the body. Second function is to cause inflammation. And any inflammation or swelling in the body is simply to increase the blood supply in that area. So whatever local heat, redness, swelling, pain that you feel at the inflamed spot, it's just a side effect because of the war going on, because all your soldiers are going in that direction. The WBCs are oozing out of the blood vessels by diabetes, uh, diabetes and destroying any damaged cell of your body or of the disease causing germs by phagocytosis. And all the dead bodies which remain behind of your tissues, of bacteria, together they form pus, which include the dead WBCs as well. Third function is formation of antibodies, particularly by lymphocytes, which is a kind of WBCs. They produce antibodies which can kill or neutralize the germs. Or any poison from them, which is called an which is by an antitoxin. These antibodies give us immunity. In fact, if we can introduce these antibodies in a in our body, that is called vaccination. Or if we can introduce some germ substance to induce the formation of these antibodies in a body, even that is called vaccination. For example, once uh, you get cold and you fight it off. So after a few days, you are well. You won't get cold immediately again because now you're immune to that particular virus. Of course, after many months, you may get the flu once again because that's because of another type of virus for which you don't have the antibodies. You see, antibodies are very specific. They help you to fight against a particular type of germ only. So once again, introduction of any germs, dead germs, alive germs, weak germs, or the germs, toxins in the body to induce 
an immune response from the body is called vaccination or prophylaxis or immunization. And if you produce, a, if you inject ready-made antibodies or ready-made antitoxins from some other person or animal, then that is more of a treatment rather than a vaccination. That is called passive immunity. We've studied all this in ninth standard. Now let's understand the types of WBCs, which is important to learn. You need to know how to identify the WBCs based on their appearance. We have granular WBCs, as you can see, it has many granules in the diagram, and non-granular don't have the granules. The granular are further classified as neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. They have a nucleus with three distinct lobes. Eosinophils have nucleus with two distinct lobes. Basophil is a nucleus large, but indistinctly lobed. Lymphocyte has a single large nucleus, and monocyte has a kidney-shaped nucleus. So that's how you can distinguish between them and identification can come in exam. As you can see out of all the WBCs in the body, 62% is of the neutrophil type. Eosinophils and basophils are very rare in the blood. Lymphocytes, 30%, that's the second most abundant type of WBC and I would say the most important. Monocytes are also important in their own way. Now, they stain with a neutral dye. They stain with an acid dye. That is, under the microscope, you can see them as colored because of the stain we have used. And these type of WBCs stain with basic dyes, hence the name basophils. Monocytes are also called scavengers or vacuum cleaners because they come in after the war is over just to collect the dead bodies. At the site of infection, they may transform into macrophages, which will ingest the germs. Now let's understand their functions. Phagocytosis, that's how neutrophils de defeat any foreign cell or object. Eosinophils also do phagocytosis, but they also secrete antitoxins and they release some chemicals called histamine. The histamines to dilate blood vessels causing inflammation and allergy. So eosinophils are linked with an allergic response in your body. Allergy is simply your immunity declaring war on a harmless substance like pollen grains, etc. So whenever they detect it, they release uh, histamine and more blood is supplied to that area, causing inflammation. The same function is done even by basophils. Even they release histamine to cause inflammation and even they are associated with allergy. And even they do phagocytosis. Lymphocytes have a very specific function. They produce antibodies. Lymphocytes are of many types. My favorite are the beta cells, or sorry, the B cells. The B cells produce antibodies which destroy germs and give us immunity. T cells also kill pathogens, although in a different way. And there are some natural killer cells, which kill all the infected and cancerous cells. And this is a part of something called innate immunity, something we are born with. Whereas the production of antibodies is a part of acquired immunity, because as we grow, we acquire immunity against certain diseases, either by suffering from those diseases or getting vaccinated against that disease. Monocytes. They ingest the germs in the cell debris, that is the leftover dead bodies after the war is over, and this is called phagocytosis, of course. Now, where are these WBCs formed? Mostly, as you can see, bone marrow, bone marrow, bone marrow, bone marrow, but the lymphocytes can be produced even in the lymph glands like spleen and tonsils, and that is why it's advised not to remove your tonsils unless it's absolutely important to, because then our immunity becomes a little weak. Next, the blood platelets are called thrombocytes, which uh, help in blood clotting. They're also non-nucleated, there, there may be 200,000 to 400,000 per cubic millimeter of blood in an adult. They are derived from some giant cells called megakaryocytes, which, in the, which is in the red bone marrow. Their lifespan is just 3 to 5 days. But without the nucleus, they cannot live for long. And they are destroyed mainly in the spleen. As I said, it's a graveyard of platelets as well. It's, and spleen is a lymphatic organ, by the way, just like tonsils are. So how do they function? This flowchart is the best way to understand blood clotting, which is also called blood coagulation. Whenever a tissue cell is injured, or the platelets are injured, they release thrombokinase, which is also called thromboplastin or factor X, also called Stewart factor. In the presence of thrombokinase, another chemical called prothrombin, which is inactive and found in the blood plasma, with the help of calcium ions, they are converted into an active ingredient called thrombin. This thrombin again with the help of calcium ions, will convert the fibrinogen into fibrin. The fibrinogen was soluble in blood, 
but now fibrin is insoluble so they form fibers and the network of sticky fibers will trap the rbcs the serum will be removed out of it if you remember serum is nothing but the blood plasma without the fibrinogen and what is left is a solid substance called the blood clot also called thrombus in dengue fever viral dengue fever the number of platelets falls and that is quite dangerous next let's talk about blood transfusion and blood groups we have many systems of blood groups we have so many blood types which you may not even have heard of the, the golden blood bombay blood the n blood group m k but they are very rare the most common blood group system is abo type now those who have the a blood group in their rbcs they have on their rbcs they have an antigen a antigen is antibody generator it's just a chemical they naturally have this stuck on their rbcs those who have the b blood group they have antigen b on their rbcs those who have ab blood group they have both the antigens on their rbcs or in their blood and those who have blood group o they have no antigen so that's how we distinguish between the four blood groups but why is this uh, why is it important to distinguish between them you see people who have blood group a and they have antigen a they naturally have an antibody b and it's an innate humoral immunity innate means inborn they born with it humoral means in the fluid and those who have blood group b they have an antibody a this means that if you transfuse blood group a to a patient who has blood group b since they have anti a antibodies there will be a reaction which can put the patient's life at risk and vice versa if you put blood group b in a patient whose blood group is a they have anti b antibody which would assume that this blood group b is a foreign danger and they will attack it they will attack this antigen b which is a foreign thing for people with blood group a people with blood group ab are safe here because they have both the antigens neither is a foreign substance for them they don't have any antibodies so whether they get a blood group or b blood group or ab blood group it's fine for them and even o blood group is fine because o blood group does not have any antigen so there is no foreign substance for them that is why ab is a universal recipient it can get blood from all the four blood groups on the other hand o blood group they don't have any antigen and they have both the antibodies a and b so they can't accept blood from a b or ab because these blood groups have antigens which are foreign for people with blood group o so o is a universal donor it can give blood to ab ab and itself o but it can't take from anybody else except blood group o so during blood transfusion knowledge of this is very important next there is a separate system called rh system which is totally different from abo rhesus factor it's a again a chemical which was found in the blood plasma some people have it some people don't in fact most of the people in the world have the rh factor so they are called positive so if your blood group is b positive then the b and positive are totally different pieces of information b means you have antigen b and of course antibody a and positive means you have the rh factor in your blood and if it's b negative means you don't have the rh factor in your blood we should know about the rh factor also because if you have rh factor then you can take blood even from a rh negative blood but people who are rh negative suppose say your blood group is b negative b negative then it's advised not to take blood from b positive because b positive has the rh factor which is a foreign thing for you so there will be an immune response of course the first transfusion should be fine it won't be risky it would simply produce antibodies in your body against the rh factor but soon if you have a second transfusion from a positive blood group then your life may be in danger so rh positive can take blood from rh negative also but rh negative people should not take blood from rh positive multiple times so this is summarized in this table which type of blood group can be given to which one this is called a compatibility table uh, what about pregnancy if the mother is rh negative and what if what if uh, the child is rh positive because the husband was rh positive the father that is for the women this rh positive factor will be a foreign substance the first time the women will get sensitized and the first delivery will be fine but if she has a second rh positive child then there may be some problem abortion may happen 
the RH factor is also called D antigen on the surface of RBCs. Hi students, this is AJ sir. If you like this video, press the like button. If you would like to enroll for my online test series or online lectures, email me or message me on Instagram. Check the description for more information.